Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs 10, verse 12, dear fellow redeemed. In all honesty, how can we even pretend to get along together, to live together, to love each other, let alone even care or love mankind, that is, other people in general, if we cannot, if we simply refuse to forgive people, especially if we refuse to forgive those that have caused us or caused those that we love pain and problems and hurt. Now, this is just true. It's hard to forgive. The deeper you've been hurt by somebody, the more difficult it will be to forgive that person, especially when you're hurt or your loved ones are hurt or you're all affected by them. There's so much pain. There's so many problems caused by those that sin against us. And yes, sadly enough, when we sin against somebody else, we may directly cause them or their loved ones pain as well. But the hurt that we experience, and if you, you don't have to travel probably too far back or maybe presently in your own life, and you might still be feeling and dealing with the effects of the pain and the hurt that someone or some ones have brought into your life or the lives of your loved ones, it might seem almost insulting then that you are commanded by God to forgive the one who's hurt you and offended you and brought so much agony. Grace is defined biblically as undeserved love. Let's be honest, we like grace. Peter tells us in the text that we are to operate under a standpoint of grace to each other, giving undeserved love to those around us. And we are happy, extraordinarily happy, when the Lord exercises his undeserved love to us and in our behalf. But what about then when God and when God tells us to exercise that same undeserved love to those that have hurt us? What about then seems like a different situation to have to look at somebody and say they have hurt me deeply and you lord forgive them you lord love them in the same way that you love me and now you're asking me to love them in that way how can that be where is the justice and yeah this is what the lord says he says take and walk away from your right to retaliate to that individual that's hurt you Absorb the pain. Take it, the Lord says. He's going to tell you how to. We'll talk about that. Short, the Lord is saying, forgive them. Now, this is hard. This is so incredibly difficult that this is a powerful message that comes through scriptures and can only be done by the grace of God. In fact, this is such a difficult thing to forgive somebody, and I'll even go to this point, to even forgive yourself when you've made a big mistake and hurt somebody, or you look back at your life and just see a series of small mistakes that maybe have amounted in a big problem and you just wish it didn't happen, but it did. This is a tall order. So difficult, though, that when a prophet of God was assigned by God, was called by God, was commanded by God to take a message of forgiveness to a group of people that have caused him and his people, so much pain, he didn't want to do it. The man turned around. God said, head wet or head east. And the man got on a boat and sailed straight east. You know who I'm talking about. Jonah. Jonah runs away from God. And as the account of Jonah goes, he hits rock bottom when he's thrown overboard. And he's swallowed by a gigantic fish. And there for three days contemplates life, contemplates his calling contemplates the Lord and his love, and then Jonah is puked up on the shore, and once again, the Lord says, go. So off Jonah goes. Jonah goes to do exactly what he absolutely doesn't want to do. There's no way he wants to go to the people of Nineveh and say to them, repent, and the Lord will spare you. What Jonah really wants to say is, please don't repent so the Lord can wipe you out and I can watch because I hate you. Well, after 40 days, 
God shows mercy. Jonah chapter 3 really shows you how he really threw his heart into trying to spread the message. He basically covers a massive city in like a day yelling, repent or God will destroy you. And yet, the miraculous, miraculous workings of the great God that he is, the people do repent. So here's Jonah. He's mad. He's angry. And he's sulking on the hillside, hoping that maybe the destruction will come. He prays to God. He basically says to God, God, I hate the Ninevites. They're the Nazis of the ancient Middle East. They've done great terror and torment to my people. And you know what, God? You're being too loving, too forgiving, and too merciful to these people. You shouldn't do it. You're making a huge mistake, God. In fact, you notice he basically says, God, I'd rather die than live in a world where you will forgive such terrible people. Now, you can see the thought process. People get angry. They may get angry at you. They may challenge you and say, you have no right to forgive the person that's done such great pain to you or others. The unbelieving world has a very, very difficult time understanding forgiveness. So what happens? It's hard to wrap your mind around forgiveness. Sadly, Jonah's reaction to God's love and forgiveness to the people of Nineveh isn't all that foreign or strange. In the ancient Middle East, they were terrible. And Jonah's saying, God, don't be so forgiving to these people. Not to them. Me? Yes. Children of Israel? Yes. Less, worse people? Yes. Them? No. They shouldn't be forgiven. Jonah doesn't want that to happen. Rather, he wants them to be destroyed. And so now you can almost see the ethical question being proposed by Jonah. Is it even right to forgive such terrible people? But notice God's response. Notice how God deals with Jonah. And be amazed at this. God asks Jonah a question. He's seeing him struggle. So he doesn't rain fire down from heaven, right? God doesn't intimidate Jonah with his awesome power. Rather, God asks a question, but Jonah senses a trap. There's a little trap coming here. So Jonah does what anyone does when they don't want to deal with something. He just straight ignores it. So God changes tactics. Read about that in chapter 4. God provides a leafy plant that grows up and brings Jonah's shade, and you can almost just picture happy little Jonah now sitting under the shaded plant, maybe hoping there'll be some destruction after all. However, the next day, a tiny worm comes into the scene, chews the plant. The sun is hot, the wind is blowing, the plant dies, and Jonah again says, I don't want to live. But what Jonah keeps going back to is this key point. He doesn't want to live in a world where God is forgiving people that Jonah doesn't want forgiven because of the pain they've brought. Jonah's acting like a little baby throwing a temper tantrum or a baby fit because he didn't get his candy bar. He didn't get his way, so he wants the whole house burned. Again, God asks him this question. It's amazing. God says, is it right for you to be upset when this plant dies? You did not plant it. You did not tend it. You did not grow it. In fact, you had nothing to do with the plant other than receive the shade it brought. And you were saddened by the loss of that plant. You had strong emotions to the plant. And here, I, God, have created these people. These people made in my image. Yes, they have turned away from me in their sin. Yes, they have caused great pain in their sin to many. Yet I, the merciful God, love them. I, the merciful God, want them to be saved. I want them to come to the knowledge of the truth. My son will shed his blood so those terrible, awful people can have forgiveness as well. Is that not right for me? And you notice it ends with that question. The whole account ends right there. And one of the things that you see in that account is God is showing us how ridiculous we look when we don't forgive. Now this isn't making light of the pain that people have caused you, and I'm sure many of you have endured great pain at the hands of others. God spare us that we have caused such pain to others, but 
may have happened with us. God is showing us how ridiculous we are when we don't forgive. Jonah, upset about a plant. As if the plant matters in 120,000 people. Who cares? They're terrible. God wants his grace and his mercy, his love and forgiveness to be extended to all people, including the people that hate God, including the people that hate us and harm us. God is looking to extend that mercy. And in that mercy and in that love and in that forgiveness, people are changed, totally changed. We're not always going to be happy. We're going to struggle with the truth that God extends grace and mercy to those that do hurt us. We might even be more unsettled that God does command us, as you heard in Matthew 18. We are ordered by God to forgive those who sin against us. We are told to show that grace, to show that mercy, and to let go of the pain that they've caused us to the Lord. This also applies to how we treat each other. In the daily petty little arguments people can easily have, especially with those that they live and work and deal with on more intimate levels. God has given us gifts to serve each other, to build up his kingdom. One of the great gifts that God has given us is the ability to truly, from the bottom of our heart, forgive. So again, I want to take you back to 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do so with the ability that God supplies. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. These are the very words of our God in preparation to be filled and strengthened by a study of these words. So we pray to the Father, sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. If as individuals we cannot live together, we cannot work together, we cannot foster this peace and harmony in the Lord unless we truly have a forgiving spirit. Unless we let go. To not let go of the hurt or pain or just nuisance or annoyance that people bring into our lives leads us in a position of becoming unproductive and even worse, unchristlike. We stand at a point where we deny the very command that our God has given us, and we deny the very strength that he gives us to fulfill that command. There's a saying, I've said it before, I'll say it again, it's so beautiful, so powerful, and biblical. You are no more like God than when you forgive. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 44 through 45. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, when you forgive, you show the world, you prove what lives in your heart that you are a son and you are a daughter of God Almighty. Let's be clear. You do not earn God's forgiveness by forgiving those who hurt you. As if the more hurt you are, the more you forgive, the more blessed you'll be by God, the more you'll earn his forgiveness. No. You are already forgiven by God. The new man that lives inside of you, created by the Holy Spirit, by the gospel, leads you and makes you able to to forgive and release the hurt, the pain, the embitterment that's been brought to you by the sins of others or even what you brought on yourself. There's no way you can truly forgive in a God-glorifying, Christ-exalting manner without the Holy Spirit in you first. Forgiveness is one of those aspects of Christianity that it's great when other people practice it. I love when other people do it. It's like spending someone else's money 
It's unlimitless. Let's just spend it away. You don't care. You love it when other people forgive, but now when we're told that we have to forgive, this gets difficult. This gets hard. This gets messy. This gets complicated. How can I do it? I want to do it. I want to do it because Christ says I should. I want to do it because Christ has done it for me. I want to do it because it, in all reality and modern psychology is finally catching up with the Bible. Not totally, but they're getting there. They're realizing there is a place for forgiveness. When you hold on to pain and hurt, you become bitter, you become jaded, and you relive that pain over and over, and you hurt yourself all over again. Better to let go. But how? That's the question. How? Through Christ, only through Jesus. Only Jesus will give you the power, the strength, and the peace to forgive. Jesus brings the healing. Jesus brings the comfort. Jesus brings the power. And Jesus brings the justice. He brings the justice. It's true when you forgive, you're, you're demonstrating your relationship with the Lord. You have all the reasons as believers in Christ to forgive those that have hurt you. You do. You have every reason. You have no reason to hold on to the sin in fact. Yes, God tells us to forgive. God tells us to love our enemies. God says that the sun, you see the sun today? I brought it up, and I brought it on the evil and on the good. The rain that fell, it fell on the just and the unjust. I'm the one doing this, and I am saying, forgive. Look at my son, Jesus. He lived a life of forgiveness for us as he hung on the cross. He's living forgiveness, and he's speaking forgiveness, saying, Father, forgive them. There's your power, Jesus. Also, think of this, though. When you have been offended, when you have been sinned against, remember that first and foremost, God has been sinned against. God has been offended, and he's been sinned against worse than you have. And he's greater offended by that sin than you are. David, in Psalm 51, 3 through 4, acknowledges this. David says this. Now, again, let's look at David. He's confessing a sin. He's asking for forgiveness. He sinned against Uriah. Not cool to take another man's wife. Not cool to murder the other man. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against his family. He sinned against his country, his nation, and the child born that died of Bathsheba. David's sin is against all of them. And what does David say first? He says, you, O Lord, have I sinned against you, Lord, my sin is first and foremost against you and then against these others. Now, here's something we have to admit. Not every sin ever committed is against us. Somebody maybe and probably is committing a sin somewhere right now that has absolutely nothing to do with me and is not affecting me. Some might, some do, some don't. Those that do usually have terrible consequences. But every sin ever committed in thought, in word, and in action is against God. And yet, God forgives. Any sin is a violation of his holy nature, of his presence, of his law, against his character, and yet God forgives. Matthew 18, one of the more dramatic examples of the weight of our sins and the debt that our sin creates and how we can't ever even hope to pay it back. And yet God forgives that. God forgives. Here's the point. We bring to God an unpayable debt of sin, and God forgives it. In real life, this is real life. This is real, real life. The Lord says, what you owe me, you can't repay. Just like the, the unjust servant. You had no hope. You had no hope of ever repaying this, ever. And the Lord says, are you like the man then? When I release you of an unpayable debt of unspeakable atrocities against me, I let those go. I send them away. I bury them in the sea, I put them in a rocket ship and blast them somewhere that you'll never see again, then when your fellow man comes to you and he brings, what, three months worth of debt, which is pretty considerable, three months of debt, that's not nothing to laugh at, you are going to seize him by the neck and demand full payment, what kind of person are you? 
Christ is saying, you are not in me if that is you. In fact, the man who wouldn't forgive is referred to as a wicked man. Now, we might be tempted to say, no, no, he's just asking for justice. He might need the money, right? He might, you know, he's got a family to feed, people to take care of. No, the Lord says, forgive. That's it. The qualification is simple. Forgive. There's no sliding scale depending on the hurt, the pain, the sin, the effects of the sin. None of that. It's simply forgive. We've offended God much more. We only hurt ourselves when we refuse to forgive. We hurt ourselves by, yes, we're living the sin. We become hardened, angry, and bitter in our hearts. But there's something else. When we don't forgive, we block grace that God has given us. We block the grace of God working in our life. Instead of being angry, instead of being hostile when you're sinned against, understand this. Understand that God does not will that sin into your life. God does not cause that sin into your life. God did not bring that sin upon you. He can't do that. He would never do that. But know this, that that trial that has resulted from that sin, God is using to strengthen and mold you. God is giving you grace. God is blessing you. God is bringing himself glory and using it for your good and the good of those around you. When you are weak, God is strong. Now, as followers of Jesus, then, living in a community of of Christians, living in a community of people who believe, trust, and confess Christ as the Savior, we need forgiveness. And forgiveness is at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German minister in the 30s and 40s, wrote this. Our community, that is basically speaking of the church, with one another in Christ, consists solely in what Christ has done for us. Christian brotherhood is a spiritual and not human reality. In this, it differs from other communities. In other words, we don't give up on each other. We don't give up on the relationships that God has brought in our lives with each other. We don't write off a fellow believer. We don't tire of forgiving a fellow believer when they sin against us, when they repent of that sin. As Christians, we forgive. We forgive, we forgive, we forgive. And as Christians, when unfortunately we fall into sin and that sin is brought in front of us and we are aware of that sin, we repent, we repent, we repent. It's the mark of faith. We don't give up. Now, Jesus speaks to us. He says, if you've been sinned against, first go to them. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Forget it. Go to them face to face. If they won't hear you, they will not hear you in love. Take two or three and go to them face to face. Pray to God that they hear. If they don't hear, go to them as the church. If any relationship has cooled off in your life, if it's been weakened because of sin, it is always on us in Christ to act first. We don't play the little game, you didn't hear what he said. You wouldn't talk to him either. Or, you don't know what it's like to deal with her. I'm not going there first. It's always on us to go first because of Christ. So forgiveness is not striking back. Forgiveness is not looking to hurt the other person. Forgiveness is not reliving the pain. It's not looking at saying, you hurt my reputation. I'm going to hurt your reputation. Forgiveness is sending away the pain. It's absorbing the hurt. It's dealing with the cost. So know this. Here in our closing moments, I'll just give a little list of what forgiveness is not and what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not ignoring the issue. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph did not ignore the issue. Joseph looked him very straight and said, you meant what you did to me for evil. Oh, but by the grace of God, he made good. David is not ignoring the issue with Bathsheba and Uriah and all of that. David is facing it and David is confessing this. In order to forgive, you have to face the matter. Forgiveness is not condoning or excusing the sin. Forgiveness is not making little of the sin. In other words, it's not David saying, oh, you yeah, know, come on, no big deal. No. Forgiveness admits reality. Forgiveness is not tolerating further abuse. If you're in an abusive situation, you have to get saved first before you can forgive. Just because you're Christian doesn't mean 
your uh, floor mat at the department store or at the mall where people wipe and spit on you. Not at all. You don't tolerate the further abuse. You want to get safe so you can work on the forgiveness towards those that are hurting you. Forgiveness is not reconciliation or restoration in the relationship. Reconciliation is reconciliation. Forgiveness, by the grace of God, may be the first step to the reconciliation. And there may be situations you can never reconcile. Maybe the person that hurt you is dead. You're not going to reconcile. Not that by the side of judgment day. Maybe the person is just so toxic that even though you do forgive them, being around puts you at great risk. And you know this either emotionally or mentally or physical or whatever. So you say, I forgive them, but I, I can't do this thing anymore. Forgiveness is not thinking everything will go back the way it was before the sin happened. That might never happen. Joseph doesn't get the 20 years back. He doesn't get the time with his father. David can't turn back the clock and bring Uriah back from the grave and put Bathsheba back with him. It's not going to happen. It may never happen. Forgiveness is not the offender. And this is a big reason why many people struggle with forgiving. They're afraid that if I forgive the person, then the offender will get away with it. Forgiveness is not the offender escapes consequences or justice. God will deal the justice, either in the end or in whatever way he sees best. The Apostle Paul wrote, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but let it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, Romans 12, 19. You want justice, that's a good thing. You should. To try to make it happen on your own is not a good thing. God knows what's needed. So what is Forgiveness. We have such beautiful look and pictures of forgiveness throughout Scripture. I'll just give you a couple. Forgiveness is you giving up your right to retaliate. You're trusting it to God. You're giving it to God. You could say or do things to hurt that person's name or reputation, make their life uncomfortable the way they made yours, but you say, no. No, Lord, I'm not going to do it. You, O oh Lord, judge justly. You, O oh Lord, heal and restore Forgiveness is changing your attitude in your heart towards the person that's hurt you. You're recapturing their humanity. Instead of turning them into this one-dimensional, almost cartoon character of evil, you're seeing them as a blood-bought soul of Christ, created in the image of God, but fallen, corrupted by sin. Oh, but please, God, create faith and bring that person back. Forgiveness is completely trusting yourself to Jesus and offering the same compassion that he's given you. Yes, this is difficult. Yes, this is hard. But by the grace of God, it happens and does happen. And the Lord, give us the strength to forgive others as we have been forgiven in Jesus' name.